Welcome back from break, everybody. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Has everybody had a uh, full helping of Voodoo Donuts? I hope. So welcome to the last panel for this 25th anniversary Animal Law Conference. I'm so pleased that you're all here. And I'm really excited about this panel because it's, it's, it's an important topic. And uh, we need to know what's going on in litigation. And of course, I love the title of this, of this panel, Don't Get Mad, Sue. It's like, that's, that's great. The latest in animal law litigation. And we have three wonderful and impressive and very experienced litigators here today to give you the latest update on the work that they've been doing, other cases that are important. So I know that you're going to learn a lot, and um, it'll be an exciting panel. So I'm going to introduce all of them, and then they are going to take it from there. Um, to my immediate left here is Caitlin Hawks. Caitlin is the Director of Litigation for the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA Foundation, where she oversees the organization's efforts to help animals via court cases. Her accomplishments include securing the release of Joe, a chimpanzee who once lived in a solitary confinement at a roadside zoo, but who now thrives among many friends of his own species at a lush sanctuary. And she's currently working on an appeal under the Endangered Species Act in the 11th Circuit, which seeks to remedy the Miami Seaquarium's illegal harm and harassment of the lone orca that lives there, Lolita. So she's doing really important work. All of this is very fitting, as she has been a PETA supporter since she was 11 years old. So she was one of those highly evolved children who knew what she was going to do at a very young age, and we're very grateful for that. At my far left is Peter Brandt. Peter Brandt is the senior attorney for farm animal litigation with the Humane Society of the United States Animal Protection Litigation Section. The Animal Protection Litigation Section conducts precedent-setting legal campaigns on behalf of animals in state and federal courts around the country. Peter's been involved in these and other animal protection issues for over a decade, and he currently oversees the entire farm animal litigation docket for the HSUS, so you know he's extremely busy. A true Northwesterner, he received his JD from Lewis and Clark Law School, and he holds a BA from Whitman College. And then in the center is Tony Ellis Susan, who recently joined the Animal Legal Defense Fund as a senior staff attorney after a 15-year career as a litigation partner with Denton's U.S. LLP. While at Denton's, Tony worked on several pro bono cases with the ALDF, going back to his time as an associate when he drafted an amicus brief that supported the Chicago foie gras ban against constitutional challenges in the Seventh Circuit. Now he handles a broad range of cases at ALDF, ranging from challenges to the waiver of certain animal and environmental protection laws relating to border wall construction to, cap to captive wildlife cases pending in several state and federal courts. And the other thing that you need to know about Tony is that he is a Chicagoan, and he wants me to say, go Cubs, go. <laughs> And I, and I promised if she said that, I would sing her a refrain. That's hey, Chicago, what do you say? The Cubs are going to win today. There you go. So please welcome our team panel. That makes me wish that I had a Dodgers jingle prepared. <laughs> I lived in LA for about nine years. Um, OK, so um, the way we're going to format this today is to try to keep it um, a bit more of a conversation, so I'm not going to go up to the podium, but we have a list of five topics that we want to um, cover with you today and give an overview of the, the litigation efforts that we've been undertaking um, in each of those subject matter areas. Um, so the first one is um, Captive Wildlife and Endangered Species Act litigation. Um, that's been a very, very active area of the law uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, litigation over the last few years. Um, the second one is ag-gag laws, another very active area. Um, the third is the recent foie gras ruling um, and federal preemption issues. Uh, and the fourth is um, personhood efforts and animal rights litigation in, in that respect. Um, there have been some interesting developments um, here and internationally. Um, and then the fifth one is uh, wildlife litigation, um, and I think primarily um, there uh, we were going to focus on coyote-related issues. Um, so, to kick it off, um, Captive Animal Endangered Species Act litigation. 
Um, so the Endangered Species Act um, grants a private right of action to citizens um, to sue to enjoin uh, what are called illegal takes under the Endangered Species Act. And the statute defines take to mean harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, trap, kill, capture, collect, um, or to attempt to engage in any of that conduct. Um, the, uh, the terms that make up the definition of take are then defined in their own right under regulations um, promulgated by the, the uh, Federal Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service. FWS regulates um, most land animals, uh, NMFS regulates uh, marine mammals, or marine animals, um, not just aquatic animals, but like polar bears and things like that. Um, so in, these, in the captive animal context, um, the terms that define take that are most commonly at issue are harm, harass, and sometimes wounding. Um, because you see, um, we're commonly suing like roadside zoos and um, aquariums and things like that, and they, we're suing over the abysmal conditions in which they're maintaining the animals. They're keep, keeping them in, in tiny cages without adequate enrichment. Um, they're keeping uh, highly social animals in, in solitary confinement. Um, that kind of thing. And so harm is defined as, as any conduct that kills or injures uh, an endangered animal. Harass is a little bit broader um, and is defined to include um, conduct that uh, alters the normal behavioral pattern of an endangered animal such that injury, injury is likely to result. Um, and wound is not defined under any regulation, but you know, the ordinary dictionary definition is what you would understand it to be, like a laceration, basically, which is a thing that, that we do sometimes see in these facilities. Um, so under this statutory and regulatory scheme, we filed a number of, um, of suits involving captive animals over the last several years. years. Um, I'm going to give an overview of just a, a few of them that the PETA Foundation has been involved in. Um, so one was uh, a case that Pam just mentioned, um, involving the orca Lolita. Um, so Lolita was captured uh, 40 plus years ago um, in waters off the coast of Washington State, where I live actually, um, and was then shipped across the country to Miami, where she lives to this day, in a swimming pool that for her is essentially the size of a bathtub. She's 20 plus-ish feet long, and the swimming pool is about 80 feet long. So that means she can basically swim the length, turn around, and swim back. Um, she's kept there without adequate shade from the, sh the sun. The only shade that she's provided is basically stadium seating that surrounds her. Um, and this is a pretty marked contrast from the like, very turbid Puget Sound waters that she came from. Um, and she's kept, rather than being kept with conspecifics, meaning members of her own species, uh, with um, Pacific white-sided dolphins who are technically a prey animal for some um, types of orcas. And so um, I, I think it causes both, type, both species distress. And as a result of this, um, they've been documented to engage in like what's called mobbing behavior, where they um, harass her by raking her flesh and causing all sorts of wounds to her. Um, so those are the conditions that she's been living in for now decades. Um, so in 2015, a coalition of groups, PETA and ALDF, um, Orca Network, and then also um, the founder of Orca Network, a, a man named Howard Garrett, um, filed suit against the facility alleging that it, its conduct violated the Endangered Species Act. Um, we unfortunately, so we, we proceeded all the way through the motion to dismiss stage, got to summary judgment. Um, in June of 2016, uh, the district court for the Southern District of Florida um, issued a summary judgment order um, finding basically that in the context of USD, USDA regulated captive endangered animals, meaning animals that are covered by the Animal Welfare Act, in addition to being covered by the ESA, there is a heightened standard at play in order to establish a take. Um, so the judge said basically that in order to establish a take of a captive endangered animal in this context, um, that animal has to have sustained some injury constituting a grave threat to his or her life. Um, that's a standard that has never been articulated before anywhere in the case law. Um, our position is that it's a standard, standard that runs contrary to uh, Supreme Court precedent under uh, Babbitt v. Sweet Home, which held that um, take, the terms defining take needed to be interpreted in the broadest possible manner. Um, that position is um, underscored by 
uh, the legislative history behind the ESA, which similarly said that um, take was to be defined broadly. And then also agency interpretation of the statute consistently indicates that both captive and wild endangered specimens are entitled to protection. Um, so that case is currently on appeal before the 11th Circuit. Um, briefing is complete. Um, and we're now set for oral argument on December 6th. So we should have resolution on that pretty soon and hopefully we'll end up um, winning and getting remanded back down to the district court. Um, so that's Lovita. Um, we've had some real crazy other cases arise recently. Um, there's a, a case also in Florida, um, in the, the middle district of Florida against a facility called Dade City's Wild Things. Um, and this is a facility that has an, a number of different species of animals, but the, the animals that are the subject of our lawsuit are their endangered tigers. Um, and so th this facility breeds or otherwise acquires tigers, um, separates, them, t separates tiger cubs from their mothers very prematurely in order to force them into encounters with members of the public. Sometimes these are like you know, tossing the animal in a swimming pool so that members of the public can swim with the animals. Sometimes they're just like land-based photo op kind of things. Um, but this conduct under the ESA, um, you know, our, our position is that it very much interferes with the normal behavioral patterns of these animals because, you know, tigers in the wild would remain with their, with their mothers for up to two years. Um, and certainly interacting with humans is not something that is natural um, for these animals. And then once they get too big to participate in these photo ops, they're discarded to kind of languish in, in small cages at the facility. Um, so we filed suit last fall, just about a year ago against this facility and things were kind of proceeding in the normal course. We were getting fairly far along into discovery. And one of the things that we really like to do in these cases is seek a site inspection of the facility so we can bring our experts in and they can document animal behavior and, um, you know, any injuries that we might not have known about before, that kind of thing. So we uh, noticed a site inspection under Federal Rule 34. Um, it was, as anticipated, a big fight. Um, it went to a motion to compel. We won the motion to compel, um, and then the next day, we got wind of the fact that the facility um, was planning to transfer 19 of its tigers um, to, it had 25 tigers total, or 24 tigers total, um, 19 of its tigers from the Florida facility, kind of under the cloak of night, um, to the greater Winniewood um, Zoo in Oklahoma, so that we couldn't do our site inspection, and then the other four five tigers went to other facilities in Florida. Um, so we had to go to the court to seek um, emergency relief to try to keep the tigers where they, where they were. The court granted our relief, but they transferred the tigers anyway. Um, so those 19 tigers are now in Oklahoma. Um, we filed contempt motions, uh, not only against the defendant facility, but against the owners of the facility and the facility itself in Oklahoma um, because they had uh, appeared to participate in a kind of conspiracy to move these tigers, um, which constitutes, you know, spoliation of evidence because the tigers themselves are the evidence in our case. Um, so all of that is currently pending. Um, we have uh, a hearing on the contempt motions before the Middle District of Florida court uh, on November 29th. It's going to be a busy few days with that right proceeding just right before the, the Lolita arguments. Um, and, you know, as a result of all the madness that's happened in this case, it's got us started thinking, like, okay, how can we make sure in our other cases that we are preserving the animal evidence that's out there um, as we kind of proceed through litigation? And right around the same time that all this stuff was going down, we were also getting ready to file suit against uh, a facility called Wildlife in Need, which is um, in Indiana. And so we sent out what's called a 60-day notice of intent to sue. Under the ESA, you're required to provide the defendant and then the, the agencies involved in regulating um, 60 days notice before you actually file suit, kind of articulating what you anticipate your claims will be. Um, and so our concern was that during this 60-day period, before we could file suit, the defendant was going to um, somehow hide or destroy or otherwise alter um, in this case, it was lions and tigers that were the subject of the suit. And we had reason to be concerned about this because this particular facility had um, been cited by the USDA for hiding um, big cats from USDA inspectors because um, they didn't want to be cited for botched declawing procedures um, that the cats had been uh, forced to undergo. Um, so 
what we ended up doing in an effort to kind of preserve the, the big cats was filing a motion under Federal Rule 27, which is a sort of an unorthodox use of the rule. But um, the way that rule works is that it allows you to take kind of pre-litigation um, discovery. Ordinarily, it's like a perpetuation of deposition testimony in a case where you um, anticipate being involved in some sort of a federal lawsuit, but for whatever reason, um, you're not able to move forward with that suit at that time. But we found some case law indicating that in addition to um, being able to perpetuate deposition testimony under the statute, um, you could also seek to um, get other forms of evidence uh, under Rule 34 if you were um, concerned that that evidence would be altered or destroyed or something. So we basically transformed this into like a motion for a preservation order um, for the, the lions and tigers, and ligers too, actually. Um, and so uh, that never got to hearing. It, we had an initial emergency hearing, and the judge said, I'm not going to grant emergency relief, but we'll have a full hearing um, basically two weeks out or something like that. Um, while we were waiting for that hearing to occur, we ended up um, basically getting in contact with the other side and entering into a consent order whereby they agreed to preserve all the, the big cats that were the subject of our lawsuit. Um, it's useful, I mean, the consent order essentially just um, transforms what are their common law obligations into a court order. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not as broad as, as maybe would be ideal, but the advantage of that is that if they violate that order, now we can go in and seek contempt instead of having to go through the motions of like spoliation sanctions and, and everything. Um, so that case, we just filed suit um, in that case. So far, no indication um, that the, the tigers have been moved or destroyed. Um, we, uh, in, in addition to filing our complaint, sought a temporary restraining order to enjoin the declawing of the animals. Um, because, I mean, that's something that is very clearly prohibited under the Animal Welfare Act, so seeking a TRO on that seemed to be, um, you know, as, as slam dunk a claim as you could, you could get in this context. Um, the TRO was entered last week. Um, we have a hearing to extend it uh, this coming Thursday. Um, so that's where that case stands. Um, we've got a number of other ESA cases as well. If you're curious about them, you can go to PETA's website, one against uh, the uh, Tri-State Zoological Park in Western Maryland, um, and another, and that also involves lions, tigers, and then lemurs, um, and then another one against the um, Missouri Primate Foundation uh, over some captive chimpanzees in Missouri. I have questions. Do you have questions? Well, I have a little <laughs> spiel. Do you want oh, to no, 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 you go, you go ahead. Spiel? Okay. Your spiel. Um, so I have a little spiel on this, uh, but before I get into my spiel, I have three quick points I just want to make. First, everyone that talked yesterday who was talking about the bright lights was not lying to you. <laughs> it's like ridiculous. <laughs> uh, secondly, you're going to see on our PowerPoint that we basically just give the, t we have five discussion points as Caitlin mentioned. Our only slides are going to list sort of the topics that we're talking about. So for those of you who are staring over here, you're cheating. You're going to have to pay attention to us <laughs> and hear what we're talking about. That's you can't, interesting as it gets, you, right? you can't read something. <laughs> and then the, the third quick point I want to make is Caitlin mentioned this Rule 27 issue. That was some really creative, sophisticated lawyering. Uh, yeah. I've litigated cases for 15 years. I'd never even heard of Rule 27. I've never seen it used. Uh, so really kudos to you yeah. for, for thinking of that. So, um, so I've got a couple points here on this captive wild animals. Uh, like Caitlin, a lot of my personal docket involves captive wild animal cases. Uh, so I could talk at length about, uh, you know, all the different cases and all the different. Um, so I, I deal with a lot of captive wild animal cases. Uh, and I just want to make sort of one big picture point, and then I'm going to talk about one specific example of one case that I'm dealing with uh, that I think sort of exemplifies why I think they're important cases. My big picture point is, and this might be simplistic uh, of me, is that captive wild animal cases almost by definition, that echo is kind of annoying too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, gosh. Um, so captive wild animal cases almost by definition involve a group of private parties or organizations suing another group of private parties regarding how they're treating their animals. So really, when you think about it, it sort of cuts at the heart of the animals as property paradigm, right? I mean, can you think of any other type of property where, you know, setting aside nuisance or somebody's using property to interfere with your, your life, where you could actually sue and stop somebody from doing something to their quote unquote property? You know, like a, a billionaire could buy a priceless work of art and burn it in his fireplace if he wanted to. You can't stop that, as far as I can think of. Um, so I think these cases are really important, even though maybe they don't deal with a large number of animals. Uh, I think they're very important because they sort of 
get at the heart of this, this legal flaw, frankly, that treats animals as property. And so one, one example of one of the cases that I work on that I want to talk about, whoa, it got really loud there as I leaned in. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one example that I want to talk about is a case that I actually started working on when I was a partner at Denton's, uh, and then I've sort of transitioned with it to the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Uh, it involves uh, a lawsuit under the Endangered Species Act, a citizen lawsuit against the San Antonio Zoo um, regarding a, an Asian elephant named Lucky. Uh, and now Lucky has a really unfortunately ironic name because she's not very lucky. Uh, she's 57 years old. She spent almost her entire life in the San Antonio Zoo. And the San Antonio Zoo, uh, if you've never been there, the habitat for the elephants is really substandard for a lot of reasons. It's too small. Uh, the ground is too hard. Uh, it's kind of an ugly, it's just not a, not a nice facility. Uh, you're in San Antonio, Texas, so it gets very hot in the summer. There's not adequate shading. There's not an adequate, adequate pool uh, for Lucky to cool off in. But the thing that struck me when I was pitched this case at Denton's that really sort of tugged at my heartstrings is that Lucky was all alone at this habitat. And I didn't know this at the time, but it turns out that Asian elephants are a very social, uh, very sophisticated social animal. Uh, and in fact, even the uh, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, uh, which you know we don't always agree with everything they say, uh, and they don't go far enough, uh, but they even recognize that Asian elephants need to be in herds. Uh, and I think they recommend a herd of at least three elephants, but yet you had Lucky in this really crappy zoo uh, just by herself for a few years. And the, the, the zoo's position was that Lucky was a special elephant. Unlike all the other elephants, she, she just wanted to be alone. She didn't really like other elephants. Uh, she really liked her, her human companions, uh, her zookeepers, and she had bonded with them, and she didn't want any other elephants around to get the human attention or something like that. Uh, and they, they pushed this propaganda out. They, in fact, they even established a website called We Love Lucky, where they had all these like bullet points about Lucky and how she's special. And, you know, as a, as a human introvert, I guess, you know, maybe there could be an elephant introvert, so maybe. Lucky really didn't like other elephants, but, but we had a behavioral specialist and several other people who had you know, known Lucky for years who said, no, no, we, we've seen her when she had companions there. Uh, and she was much happier when she had companions. Now, there was one, one companion who was maybe a little bit uh, aggressive, and so you got to set him aside. But, but the other companion, she was much happier. Uh, and so we filed a lawsuit. And even when we were filing the lawsuit, the zoo was like, no, 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 these people are crazy. Lucky doesn't like other elephants. But magically, three or four months after we filed the lawsuit, another elephant appears in the dead of night in this habitat without notice or anything. Uh, and then a few weeks later, there's a third elephant. And it turns out what happened is the San Antonio Zoo had gone to Feld Entertainment uh, and found two retired circus elephants named Karen and Nicole. And they, they brought them into the zoo. Notwithstanding their We Love Lucky website that said Lucky doesn't want other elephants, they now had three elephants at the zoo. And a funny thing happened. Lucky really liked them a lot, and they liked Lucky, and they bonded, uh, and they were all very, very happy, and they formed this social circle, uh, and, and it was great. And then the other thing that happened, surprisingly, is all the propaganda that the zoo had pushed out started disappearing from the cyberspace, and the We Love Lucky website didn't talk about how Lucky was special anymore. It talked about how Lucky loved her new friends, and how great and happy she was with Karen and Nicole, and how the zoo is the greatest zoo in the world because they brought her these, these two new friends. Uh, so I, I wanted to sort of focus on Lucky and how happy she is now, because that's something that we achieved, you know, without even a victory in the lawsuit, right? This is something that we, we just, just by filing the lawsuit, we changed the behavior of the zoo. Had we not filed that lawsuit, Lucky would probably still be alone. And I also wanted to focus on Lucky because, you know, I've really been enjoying the other presentations uh, throughout this conference. Uh, a lot of people, a lot smarter than me, talking about a lot of important issues. But, but some of the points they've raised have been pretty damn depressing, I have to say, right? Uh, like yesterday's slide, where you're talking about billions of fishes, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of animals being killed every year. And you sort of, at least I, fell into a sort of forest tree problem, right? I mean, the numbers are just so massive. You know, you can't even imagine the suffering. And then you, you think about the individual and the suffering and, like, the life of, you know, a pig that's at a factory farm and how horrible that life is. And then you you think, well, that's just one of these you know, hundreds of millions, and it, it becomes almost overwhelming. You want to, you know, at least I, again, I'll, I'll just talk for myself, 
I want to run to the bar and, you know, grab like a couple of bottles of vodka or something and just, you know, start like self-medicating. It's so depressing. A lot of lawyers do that. <laughs> exactly. Trust me, I come from a large law firm. Trust me, I know, I know it well. <laughs> uh, uh, so, I, so I wanted to focus on Lucky because you can, you know, it's easy to sort of fall in this trap of getting super depressed by focusing on just the sheer numbers of animals out there. But, you know, I'm an optimist at heart. Uh, and so I sort of like to focus on Lucky and think about, hey, she's happy now or happier, you know, maybe it's not a perfect environment, maybe she's not in the sanctuary like she, we'd like her to be, uh, but the rest of her life on this planet, she's going to be happier because she has her new, two new elephant friends, and that's all because of all of our efforts, you know, and even if it's just one animal who's a little bit happier, to me it seems like the time and effort's worth it. So that's, that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> I had I had sort of a wonky, perhaps boring technical question about <laughs> Rule 27 and like Lucky's Lucky's situation, um, and I'm going to make this about me because I had a situation um, similar where you're in the beginning stages of litigation and your defendant does something surprising without letting you know. Um, but in the, like Luck, Lucky's a good example. That's an improvement. They're, they're altering the evidence, but it's sort of an improvement. And I, I, I was involved in a lawsuit in Central California where these people had a lake, 13-acre lake of liquefied chicken manure, and it made life unbearable to live next to it. But in the, you know, without telling anybody, this guy went out there and started cleaning up the, the lake seven days a week, you know, 12 hours a day. And you, we had to have these difficult conversations where, like, this is what the lawsuit's about. We want this to get cleaned up, and he's doing it. And, I, and what do you do? Um, I mean, ultimately, where we came down in that is we sent a bunch of angry letters saying you're destroying evidence, and we um, recovered sanctions. But it was a big, I don't know if I can swear on this, it was a big pain in the neck uh, to go through a spoliation of evidence. And the magistrate judge said, no, no, he didn't destroy evidence. Um, and the district court judge said, yeah, he did destroy evidence, and we, we recovered attorney's fees and that. But, I mean, did you, it's difficult when they're improving things, right? It is, yeah. 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 I mean, and as, as I said, your, your evidence here is the animal. So, you know, like, if the evidence is, technically, they are required to kind of preserve the evidence, including the animals, as in the ordinary course. But if the changes they're making are to improve the circumstances for those animals, then yeah, I mean, I think it's a case-by-case -case conversation that you have to have, but I certainly wouldn't want to be the one to, to say no to, to that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and in the, in, similar in the Lucky case, uh, it certainly was a consideration. I mean, we were somewhat hamstrung because under the Endangered Species Act, our notice letter went only to Lucky. So in theory, we might not have standing as to Karen and Nicole. And then once they bonded, you know, now do we really want to move Lucky? Yeah. Right? Right. She's bonded. Right. Uh, and I think we, you know, where we came down is, look, you know, she has bonded. If we could figure out a way through negotiation settlement to get them all three to a, a better place, that would be good. But we certainly don't want to be the force that, you know, that breaks up this bonded herd now. Yeah. So where does that litigation stand right now? We, uh, well, we got summary, the summary judgment ruling, which, by the way, in our summary judgment ruling, sort of another, to follow up on Caitlin's point, our judge was harshly critical of the uh, Lolita judge in Florida and basically explained uh, in, in three or four very strongly worded persuasive points why he was totally wrong. Yeah, we submitted that under uh, Appellate Rule 28 to the yeah. 11th Circuit. Um, exactly. So thank you for getting us that order. Yeah, well, well, well no, it, was a lot. It, was, it wasn't me. I can't take credit for it. But, um, and, and I should mention that our judge, actually, it's interesting in Texas, he's a, he's a Republican. Uh, he was a Rick Perry appointee to the state Supreme Court before he became a federal judge. So it's sort of nice to see somebody that's sort of from that side of the line who can still follow the law in, in support of animal, animal issues. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had sort of a big picture question to, because uh, I, I was feeling pessimistic when hearing about Lolita. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to detract from Tony's optimism, but I'm going to do a little bit. Um, I, like, I don't deal with wildlife law at all, really. Um, I, did maybe a few times years ago, but I was always struck by these really protective provisions in federal wildlife law, you know, like the Marine Mammal Protection Act, 
compared to farm animal laws. You know, if you sing out of tune near a sea lion, like you'd go to federal prison, theoretically. But then in the reality is you have Lolita, and, right. which is really depressing because I, you know, you think about next door, they're talking about legislation. You think about trying to improve the laws. And when you see how good those statutes seem to be and then how it translates on the ground, how do, how do we fix this? Yeah, I mean, in Lolita, hopefully the 11th Circuit will do it for us. That was that decision was was wholly out of left field. I mean, really, like th there are portions of that opinion where the judge is actually citing the dissent from Babbitt v. Sweet Home. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I am hopeful that that we have a good chance of prevailing on appeal, and at, at the very least, then the ESA and the 11th Circuit will go back to meaning what everybody else always understood it to mean, which is that captive animals are protected just like wild animals are protected um, and not subject to this heightened standard. Um, but yeah, it is, it is challenging. I mean, with captive animals, I, I'm not sure. I mean, very few of these cases have actually been seen through to completion, so it's tough to say hmm. how it'll be enforced, I guess. Yeah, it, I mean, it is a tough situation even when you have, you know, good legislative efforts that turn into good laws. You can have bad results. You know, I have a case with a captive wild animal dealing with state law in Louisiana. Uh, and we have a good law there, and you know, through an unfortunate set of circumstances, it's been very difficult to get the relief that we think we're entitled to. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we want to go to the next topic? Or? Sure. Okay. Um, so I think ad gag is, is next up. Okay. Uh, well, I'll start, but uh, I am not the ad gag expert, um, and. Um, I just want to, I've been thinking a lot this morning and yesterday about sort of big picture issues related to undercover investigations and the ag gag laws and um, the recent decisions, um, particularly the Utah decision, um, which I don't know how many people ever actually read the materials that go with conferences, but you can read the Utah decision from this past July. Um, that's the ALDF v. Herbert decision, um, and it's phenomenal. Like I. Uh, I, you know, I like Judge Windmill's decision in Idaho, um, and um, I've long been a fan of Judge Windmill, if you can be a fan of an Idaho district court judge. Um, but uh, the Utah opinion from the summer is just beautifully done, and it goes over the nitty-gritty um, way more, and way better than I can, can do it. But um, uh, the thing that I was thinking about with big picture wise with um, ag gag and investigations uh, you know yesterday Lauren Ornelas was talking about how after there are there's been a lot of animal undercover farm animal investigations slaughterhouses factory farms all different types of species all over the country particularly accelerating um, since the turn of the century um, and we do this a lot. Uh, I mean, where I work, the Humane Society, we do investigations, but all, a slew of other groups. Mercy for Animals does phenomenal investigative work, Compassion Over Killing, ALDF has done it. Um, and the thing that Lauren said that was really depressing to me was the idea of ICE raids happening right after uh, investigation footage comes out. Um, which is not something I had thought specifically about. Um, but I think that's really horrible. Um, and the investigation has been a very, very important tactic um, for our movement. Um, it, it, investigations like this uh, for many different types of social justice movements have been hugely important. I mean, we have a Federal Meat Inspection Act because Upton Sinclair went in and documented what he saw at the turn of the, the 19th to the 20th century. Um, but, you know, and Lauren's other point yesterday is particularly well taken. Like, what happens is we now have a pattern. There's an investigation. There's like a crisis handbook for these facilities. They go in, they fire the people that have the worst job in the world, and they blame everything on the people they fire. And if they're lucky, that's kind of where it ends. And one of the things that's depressing to me, seeing this over the last decade or so is how many of these operations are still alive and well, um, you know, the year after an investigation breaks. Um, they're not all alive and well, but a lot of them are. They follow this blame the little guy 
get him fired, um, and I'm going to tell you an even sadder story. Um, and then the, it's business as usual. Um, so it, my question is, do we need to rethink this? Um, and I'm not sure we do, and my investigation staff would probably argue with me if they were up here. Um, but um, I was reading this phenomenal book by a British author called Ben McIntyre about the birth of the SAS, which I didn't really know about. But the idea of parachuting in some soldiers behind enemy lines and destroying a, a specific target, like blowing up all these Nazi planes in northern Germany or going in and killing a, you know, a particular general, that idea did not exist until uh, well into World War II. That was not even a concept. Warfare was you line up guys and they kill each other. And, and that was what wars were. That's what World War I was. And this new concept of, you know, a whole new tactic emerged, which is now one, you know, I'm not saying I approve of it, but it has changed everything. Um, that's why there's no Osama bin Laden. All of that is traced directly to a new idea about how to do something. Um, and there's a lot of young people here, and um, I sort of thought when I came out of law school, like, well, people have tried everything to help animals. Um, and I didn't realize that there's hardly been any animal lawyers in the history of the world, in the history of the United States. You know, we are a large percentage of the West Coast population of full-time animal lawyers right here. There's still not a lot of animal lawyers. So we need new ideas and we need um, creativity. Um, and uh, one investigation that I, I haven't been involved directly with a lot of investigations, but one of them pops up in, in the ag-gag decisions is the 2008 Hallmark investigation. And um, two guys were criminally prosecuted. The state of California, the DA's office in San Bernardino, one after two guys. And um, I'm going to tell you about the second-in-command guy. He wasn't even the boss. The second-in-command guy, and I watched hours of video of this, and it really damaged me. Um, and he, he just did, he went out of his way to do cruel things. There's some cruelty at slaughterhouses that's just inherent. Um, this guy went out of his way to abuse animals. But he was arrested, and he was immediately deported. And his wife, not his wife, but the, the mother of his three children said, we haven't heard from him. Like, he was sent back to Mexico, and we haven't heard from him. And I don't think it's fair that he was doing his job, and the people making all this money, and there were millions of dollars made at this facility, they didn't get in trouble. And she's got a really good point. Um, they did get in trouble later, um, which makes me feel a little bit better. You know, you never get exactly what you want. I wish they had gotten in more trouble. Um, and that was just sort of coincidence, that, that the, the people wearing suits and ties and, and living in fancy houses actually got in trouble in that investigation was, you know, the facts just lined up that way. But, yeah, it sucks for, uh, for just the low-level people to be um, kind of screwed over by this because this is the worst, most dangerous job we have, basically, um, unless you're, you know, an Alaska crab fisherman. It's, it's a rough, horrible job that doesn't pay well. Um, but the ag-gag decisions, uh, the Ninth Circuit, uh, I know I've been going on kind of an editorial, but the Ninth Circuit, where, where we are now, we're waiting for a decision from the Ninth Circuit. Um, and uh, the, the Utah decision, the state of Utah just decided not to appeal, um, which is fantastic. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next year or two. I mean, the Ninth Circuit can take forever, um, or we could have an opinion tomorrow. Um, they really, at the oral argument, the Ninth Circuit judges were very skeptical, um, as all these judges are, because the legislative history, like, these guys were just, it's the language of dum-dums, you know. Uh, like, you should know you're on the record when you're saying things like, this is just about them vegetarians coming in here. Like, you get that on the record, you should expect to see it in a federal court opinion, and you did. And I think they just never believed a word the state's attorneys said about, oh, well, this is about biosecurity, which, sidebar, there's a special place in hell for people that say 
they're concerned about biosecurity at a factory farm because it's a biosecurity nightmare by definition. Okay, that's my long-winded rant. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm happy to go next. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I, I had a couple things I want to talk about, but I, picking up on your point um, on the nature of investigations, I mean, I don't know how we would do this, but I guess one way to try to deal with the issue you're addressing of trying to go up high, higher up the corporate ladder would be to get an investigator that's you know, more into the belly of the beast, right? You'd have to have somebody who, you know, out of college tries to get a job, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that he's just going to work or he or she, um, you know, for maybe five, ten years and sort of get get their way up the corporate ladder and then blow the whistle from the inside. Uh, that would be a pretty big commitment, but that would be one so way So you, you've got corporate experience. Do you, would they, I don't know how any, how any of this works, but would they necessarily make you sign all kinds of non-disclosure agreements and... So it's interesting, one of the points I was going to make, uh, and I wasn't going to get into specifics, with, was that I think from the industry perspective, there are probably other ways to deal with, with what they're trying to accomplish and shutting down investigations, uh, you know, rather than, you know, pursuing these criminal laws or civil laws, ag ag laws. Uh, I mean, I think, and again, I don't want to get into specifics, but it, it seems to me there's non, you wouldn't even need legislation to sort of engage a certain practices and you know that that might be an example hmm. you know and there's probably things that you could build on that that I, I don't want to talk about but, <laughs> um, but yeah but that's I think that's an interesting thought and something that we should we should think about um, so I just want to make a few points and I'm really I am going to reflect sort of on my experience as a corporate lawyer because I think you know maybe I can provide a unique perspective of how the industry five minutes left in the whole thing or <laughs> Oh, wow. Holy cow. <laughs> oh, my God, how'd that happen? <laughs> well, I'm going to go really quickly now since we're on topic two of five. <laughs> um, so, I, so I thought I had a few, uh, wow, that's amazing, um, uh, from my unique perspective from a corporate lawyer that I could sort of provide. And, and I think, you know, obviously it's great that we've had all the success uh, fighting the egg egg laws. They're horrible laws. Um, but uh, from my perspective, um, you know, they sort of, and it could cut both ways. Like the industry maybe knew that they were subject to constitutional challenges and just didn't care, uh, or maybe they you know, didn't realize that they'd have these you know, strong constitutional challenges. But it seems to me that they were just like sloppy overreaching. Uh, they were almost destined to fail, at least some of the, some of the versions of the ag-gag laws. Um, and so I think you know, one thing we need to be cognizant of is what is the industry going to do to adapt to these adverse rulings? You know, you're already seeing some of that where they're trying to modify the laws and, and you know, shore up, you know, some of the issues in the ag ag laws. But then again, there's, you know, maybe other methods they could pursue um, to try to accomplish the same objective. And I, I think it's important that we start thinking about, and, and we already are, um, you know, if they do pursue these other strategies, are there ways we can preempt those now uh, be before we, we're, we're totally out of time? No, uh, oh. Oh, oh. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. You, you're, you're probably signing the other way than we're signing. But, um, but so now I'm going to give my, my little bit longer spiel. Um, so, so one of the things I was going to say is if, you know, so if I was still back at Denton's and the agricultural industry approached me and said, hey, Tony, we've got this problem. Uh, we've got all these undercover investigators and they're filming all these things about our factories and it's causing us all these problems. We want to shut them down. How do we do that? Uh, well, so the first thing I would say, just to be clear, is I'd say, fuck off, I'm not going to represent you. Uh, so I just want that clear on the record. Uh, but then the second thing I would say is sort of picking up on this point, uh, and really there's, there's sort of two points here. There's two things I, I would do. One, and I know somewhere there's a camera live streaming this, I guarantee you I would have an associate at a firm monitoring these types of presentations to pick up on tidbits of what the lawyers are saying. So. If there's an unnamed associate watching <laughs> us right now, uh, I say hello. I hope uh, the Maserati was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and if you can, in the 30-page memo you're going to draft with your notes, you know, if you can specifically mention that I waved at you and acknowledged you, I think your, your boss might get a kick out of that. So. And, then the, and the second thing is I, I do think that there are, uh, I mean, really, I wouldn't have gone the egg egg route at all uh, if I were advising the industry. I would have gone a completely different direction. Uh, and it's a direction that scares me because I, you know, hopefully I'm missing something, but I think uh, it maybe is a more elegant solution to accomplish some of the objectives that they're trying for. So I think it's really critical that 
you know, even when you're getting victories in an area of law, you've got to be thinking about, you know, where are things going to morph? What's the next step my opponent's going to make? And are there things I can do now to try to preempt and soften what they might do in the future? Um, so that was sort of my point. Can I say one quick thing? Yeah. Uh, so um, the nice thing is it's not only lawyers and it's not only legislators and judges. There's the press that hate these laws. Um, and so you, you would see uh, some, junior some junior representative in Fresno is, is told, hey, go push this ag gag law in California. And he goes and introduces it, and he has no idea the hell that's going to be unleashed on him. And the LA Times will print an editorial. His local paper will print an editorial. So some of these things get proposed and then backed off of when they realize the heat. So it's not totally up to us. There's societal pressure, um, which is often really the more effective thing. And I should say, ALDF and PETA are, are parties to the Utah case, and we're not uh, at the Humane Society. So I, I don't want to be like claiming credit. <laughs> do you want to go to the next topic, or do you want to? Yeah. Um, no. I, I, in the interest of time, I think let's let's try to push through the next topic. Um, okay. So next on the list was foie gras, I think, oh. um, which is again oh, Peter. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, foie gras. Um, the battle continues. Uh, just generally, I think people probably in this room know the state of California enacted a ban on force feeding ducks and geese. And it also, another piece of the ban was selling the product of a force fed duck or goose. Um, when the law took effect a few years ago, um, Canadian and New York foie gras producers challenged the sales ban. The sales ban is really the critical piece um, in the current fight. Um, there is, as far as I know right now, no foie gras being produced in California because that would be illegal at this point. Um, but these guys in New York and Canada really want to be selling foie gras in Los Angeles and San Francisco, et cetera. Um, so uh, this is a really sexy topic, uh, express preemption under the Federal Poultry Products Inspection Act, which uh, I can tell you're excited. Um, so uh, but the good news is the Ninth Circuit, um, well, I mean, the basic argument, and it's really just kind of odd, the, the Poultry Products Act, the federal act from the 1950s, 1957, um, says no state or local government can impose an ingredient requirement, and the text is the king in an express preemption case. If you don't remember anything else, I say what little I know here is if you're not talking about the text of the statute and you're talking about express preemption, you're probably going to lose. Um, so um, an ingredient requirement, states can't impose them. It, it, it has to be, if you impose an a requirement by state law that's not identical with the federal requirement, that state law requirement is going to fall. So um, these guys are saying, well, foie gras is an ingredient and you're banning the sale of foie gras, so that's, uh, California's banning the ingredient of foie gras. And um, the Ninth Circuit said, no, um, the law bans force feeding ducks and geese, and we don't believe that foie gras can only be produced by force feeding. And the way an animal is raised, like the way it's treated on a farm, is not an ingredient. An ingredient is a physical element in the product. Um, and um, the, uh, they were, were, the Ninth Circuit was sort of helped out in that because the, the USDA has said the Poultry Products Inspection Act has nothing to do with what happens on farms, and force feeding happens on farms. So the scope of the federal act is really about slaughterhouses and it's about labels on chickens. It's not about what happens to an animal on a farm. And the, the Ninth Circuit said, um, you can, a state is free to ban an entire category of meat, like horse meat, which many states have banned, including California. The state can make a moral decision, we don't want dogs and cats or horses uh, being meat, if, the, if they, you know, have a defensible reason for that. If it reflects the state's morals, it's within the state's traditional police powers. Um, and um, so if a, and if a whole category of meat is banned, then it doesn't ever get into the system, the federal system of poultry product regulation, which is, again, all about what happens inside the slaughterhouse and the labeling of the product. Well, if you're 
working at a remove from the slaughterhouse before the animal ever gets there, you're not even getting into the federal system. So, um, like I said, we're not done. This is the, the uh, foie gras guys have petitioned for rehearing on Bonk at the Ninth Circuit. So um, we'll see what happens with that. But uh, you know, they could try to take it up to the Supreme Court. Do you have anything, Caitlin? Or? Um, I don't. No. Okay. Do I just had a real quick point. I'll make really quickly, uh, and it sort of picks up on an earlier conversation about you know when you have litigation successes, you got to think about other things. And here. I think there's legislative efforts underway at the federal level, uh, and I'm not a legislature, so I don't know much about it, but I think there's a, a James Sensenbrenner, who I think is in the House uh, from Wisconsin, who I think was a part of the Clinton impeachment proceedings 20 years ago, and he looked like a, a heart attack waiting to happen then, so I don't know how he's still around now, but, uh, but I think he uh, introduced a law called the uh, No Regulation Without Representation Act which in theory is trying to sort of combat these types yeah. of state initiatives. So it's, it's sort of the shut up California and take whatever we want to feed you yeah. kind of like if we make it in Iowa, you have to eat it in California. Yeah. <laughs> so, there, so there you go. So when you have litigation successes, you always got to be looking uh, right. for other for other angles of attack. But that's all I got on that. Do we want to go to the next topic? Yeah. So the next topic was, was personhood, which is a very broad topic. Um, but. You know, I, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, one of the most fundamental barriers we, we face as animal lawyers is, you know, the fact that, that the law regards animals as, as mere things. And so um, trying to establish standing in order to protect animals can be challenging. We have a number of tools to do it. You know, we can sue, we can, we can find individual plaintiffs who have sustained an aesthetic injury, like suffered emotional harm or something as a result of having seen something horrible happen to an animal. We can sue um, as organizations on behalf of, of our members, if the, the members have suffered injuries, that's, that's associational standing. We can sue for direct injuries to the organization itself, like as in the ag gag cases. Um, you know, there was an investigational injury because our organizations wanted to conduct investigations that they were now refraining from conducting because um, they had fear of being prosecuted under these statutes. Um, there's also Haven Standing, which, um, you know, allows you to argue that you've been forced to divert resources to kind of counteract the misconduct of defendants um, if, if it operates in a way that y your mission is impaired by it. Um, so we do have tools, but um, animal advocates have, you know, also at the same time been trying to uh, make efforts to push for animals to achieve something closer to personhood so that they can assert their own rights and we don't have to go through this additional step of trying to, to step in on their behalf. Um, there's been some progress in this respect over the years. Um, in, in fact, in, on the international front, in November of 2016, there was actually um, a judge in Argentina who recognized a chimpanzee named Cecilia as a legal person um, with inherent rights, um, and as a result of the granting of the habeas petition, um, found that Cecilia should be transferred from the zoo where she was being held, which I think was in Mendoza, Argentina, um, to an appropriate sanctuary. Um, and then, you know, back in the U.S., animal groups have been pursuing this kind of thing for a while. The Non-Human Rights Project has pursued habeas petitions in state courts. Um, from PETA's perspective, in the last couple of years, we've been trying to look for kind of statutory hooks, where the, there's language in a statute that would allow us to construe it um, to grant standing to an animal. Um, so most recently, you've probably heard about the monkey selfie case. Um, and that actually, that case just settled out, um, but it was a case that arose under the Copyright Act, and it was um, filed on behalf of a crested macaque named Naruto, who uh, lived in Indonesia and basically uh, came upon a, a um, photographer's camera that had been left unattended and took a number of, of pictures of himself. The pictures were great. If you haven't seen them, Google them. Um, so the, the Copyright Act actually protects quote, original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medi medium of expression now or later developed. Um, and it grants standing to sue for infringement to the legal or beneficial owner of an exclusive right under the copyright. Owner is defined by the statute as the author or authors of work. Author is not defined. Um, so if you look to the Constitution itself, um, it grants Congress the authority to protect the writings of authors. Um, and the Supreme Court has examine the term author um, in, and given it the broadest possible meaning, um, it's interpreted just to mean the originator of a work. So we looked at this kind of definitional chain and concluded, well, I mean, Neruda was undeniably the originator of this work. He took the portraits of himself. 
Um, so we filed suit under the Copyright Act as a next friend of Naruto um, in the Northern District of California. Um, the lower court, however, ultimately found that Naruto lacked standing because the Copyright Act does not explicitly grant standing to animals. Um, so we appealed that decision to the Ninth Circuit, um, had oral argument on it, um, but during the pendency, while, while um, we were waiting for the Ninth Circuit to issue a decision, um, we were able to reach settlement, um, and the settlement required that the photographer uh, whose camera Naruto used to take the photos of himself um, donate 25% of um, any future gross revenue that he derives from using or selling any of the, the monkey selfies um, to registered charities that are dedicated to protecting um, Naruto and other crested macaques like him in Indonesia. Um, we also sought um, to have the lower court decision vacated because um, you know, this is a right that we contend is, belongs to Naruto and so we are settling as, as PETA and so we want the lower court decision vacated so that Naruto still has the right um, to pursue action on his own behalf. Um, so that's kind of where that stands. Um, I think Tony had something further to, to say about uh, personhood issues in the context of Tony the Tiger. Yeah, I can talk really quickly. I yeah. think we're, we're almost out of time now for real, probably <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> um, so we, we filed a case uh, regarding Tony the Tiger, uh, who's a tiger that's at a truck stop in Louisiana. We had issued a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act request, and we'd sought to expedite that request under the theory that uh, the FOIA statute itself says if you're worried about the health or well-being of an individual, uh, you can get an expedited treatment. And we argued Tony was an individual. Uh, and in fact, Matthew Liebman, my boss, found this. One of the dictionaries, it's really great. I mean, it's like the best thing ever. It uses, one of its usages of the word individual is a tiger. It says the markings of each tiger are unique to the individual. <laughs> so you literally have the dictionary telling you that a tiger is an individual. Uh, so we, we've raised that argument. We've now filed that lawsuit uh, in the Northern District of California, and we're going to engage in some uh, cross-summary judgment briefing with the government. They're going to argue our, our claim is moot because they gave us the records, and we're going to argue it's not moot, and we're entitled to a, a judgment on the merits. Um, so the only remaining topic that we have is, is wildlife. <laughs> we have one minute. Know. Should we take <laughs> questions? I mean, I'm yeah. happy to yeah. talk wildlife. No, I am. Um, I mean, well, here, I can give like a 10-second thing, yeah. maybe. Uh, this is my topic. Uh, let's see here. Um, so, so there's a series of cases out there challenging a program by the Wildlife Services, uh, which basically is a, a, an arm of the USDA um, that goes out and, well, here, here, here's the best part. So their website, here's how they describe themselves. Quote, we provide federal leadership and expertise to resolve wildlife conflicts to allow people and wildlife to coexist. Now, now, when I read that, in my mind, I envisioned like a bear, a wolf, a human, like holding hands in a circle and sort of, you know, talking out their issues and trying to get on the same page. But uh, in reality, what Wildlife Services is, and this is, I think, a quote from our complaint, so you have to forgive the rhetorical flourish here, it's an agricultural industry killing machine, uh, particularly in the Western United States, where it protects livestock and ranchers from so-called predators like coyotes, wolves, foxes, mountain lions, grizzly bears, and eagles. And that is, in fact, what it is. I mean, it, it kills tens of thousands of, of uh, so it kills tens of thousands of animals that it's targeting to try to kill to protect the livestock. And, and it does that whenever, you know, any rancher says, oh, I saw a coyote over there. Oh, well, let's get, us, get out there with a gun and shoot the coyote. We don't want the livestock to get damaged. Uh, but unfortunately, they use a lot of methods, not only the lethal methods, but they use a lot of methods that have uh, indiscriminate impacts. So they kill a lot of endangered species inadvertently. Uh, you may have heard things about the cyanide bombs that even you know people's companion animals will sometimes get into and die. Uh, and the, the really horrible thing about it is it, it turns out there's all this scientific literature out there that shows these lethal methods are not effective, or at least less effective than non-lethal methods. But yet, the, the Wildlife Services hasn't done anything to try to change their ways. And so what these lawsuits out there are doing and are basically saying in a nutshell uh, is, is that you need to engage in an environmental review of this program to ensure that you can't have a, a better alternative. Like, hey, let's use non-lethal methods instead of lethal methods. Uh, and they've been successful at the state level. PETA's had some success with these. We've had some success with these uh, under the California Environmental Quality Act. And we have a federal case under the federal NEPA Act with uh, Centers for Biological Diversity. So I finished in time.
right. So now we're, we're ready for questions. If people have questions, or do you have anything? No, no, no. So if people have questions, feel free to fire away at the mic over there. Hi, I'm short. <laughs> uh, my That's name is. A statement. <laughs> Sorry, it's going to be a question. I promise. Uh, my name is Rachel. I'm a 2L at Lewis and Clark Law School. Um, my question kind of relates to what Tony was saying about the propaganda from the zoo. So I have found that, in my personal experience, that the zoo has a very strong propaganda machine. And I was wondering first if you find this to be a hurdle in your cases to overcome with judges. And secondly, what people, non-legal people, citizens, advocates can do to educate the public to help overcome those hurdles going forward. Yeah, I can start. Sure. Um, so I, I think you've identified a really crucial problem. So some of the earlier Endangered Species Act cases that were successful were brought against roadside zoos, which were horrible and deplorable. Um, but when you deal with a, a zoo that's accredited by the AZA or whatever, there's sort of a, you know, a, from a judicial perspective and a public perspective, there's sort of a reputational shield that they have, uh, which makes like the Lolita case against Miami Aquarium, uh, to some extent, and our lucky case against the San Antonio Zoo, you know, more difficult than a roadside zoo where you have, you know, you just see it, you realize that there's something wrong here. Um, so that certainly is an issue we have to deal with uh, as, as far as our litigation goes. Yeah, and in the context of, of roadside zoos, most of our active cases right now are against roadside zoo type facilities. And, and one of the most powerful tools we have actually is just a, a good kind of arsenal of experts. Um, and we've, we've got a, a great group of people who we've been able to rely on in these cases. And some of them are actually employed by AZA accredited facilities. Um, and they do a great job kind of breaking down why these roadside zoo facilities are entirely deficient with respect to the care that they provide and the conditions in which they keep the animals. Thanks. Hi. Uh, I am in the LLM program and I'm from Bolivia originally. So first of all, I don't know if I'm the, in the correct room because my comment is going to go like you will, you will listen to it and maybe I should have gone to the next room because I know the premise of this panel is like if you get mad, sue. But from what I am learning about your system, it looks incredibly complicated to me. Like I come from a civil system. And I must say, like the hurdles you have to go through, just proving standing and all those things, it's, it's this, and all the decisions I'm trying to grasp and everything, it seems like it's something very discretional. And one judge uh, bases his opinion on one thing, and he has an interpretation that is totally opposite to another judge in this circuit. So I'm wondering, I know, like, like I said, I don't know if it's the right panel, but what do you think? Don't you think we should be making more friends in the industry, infiltrating enemy lines, making more allies with the people, even if they're, they don't share our values and we're not like in the same line? Shouldn't we be working on being making more judge friends, more powerful people friends instead I'm of trying. being <laughs> that, yeah. that was my comment and my question for you. Like, I don't know if it's naive, but. Yeah. I, I think it will be like a useful technique. Yeah. Do you, I have a couple of thoughts. Go ahead. Do you, um, so, so a couple of things. I mean, I, I do know a few federal judges out there who are very sympathetic uh, to animal issues, um, federal judges, uh, and state judges, actually. We had a case, a uh, FOIA state case in Illinois State Court before a, an Illinois state judge, and I know she, uh, she very much cares deeply about these issues, and she ruled in our favor. Go figure. Uh, but we should have won under any judge. but. Um, but I think really the, the answer to your question about how do we get more people in power is all of you, uh, the SALDIF chapters, all the law students out there who are learning animal law. Uh, and it's one of the points I make uh, within our, our sort of group at the LDF that, you know, it's easy to get frustrated that things aren't changing as fast as you might like. But I'm old and I've seen things change and, and there have been massive improvements in this area. And 20 years from now, you won't believe how great it will be compared to what it is now. So you just have to sort of be optimistic, keep, you know, keep fighting and plugging away, but ultimately it's going to be all of you who are going to be federal judges and state judges out there, you know, recognizing the rights of animals. 
Hi. Um, I know I'm the worst timekeeper of all time. I'm sorry. I, I'm in law, law school, not math school. Um, but my question is, do any of you have any experience with using the administrative system to try to, um, uh, I don't know, write petitions for rulemaking, or do you, do you work explicitly with just civil litigation or any, any opinions on, on that? Uh, I, yeah, we do. We do. Uh, my work has been a lot of times petitions for rulemaking, or just submitting comments that are, if you if you can make them scary enough, so that the agency thinks like, well, there's a good chance we're going to lose once this becomes a lawsuit. Then we've had some luck in just like derailing bad ideas that that like USDA or somebody else has. Um, so it's definitely administrative law. I always tell if you're interested in animal law, I always say that's a thrilling class that everybody should take. Yeah, I agree. yeah, and we also do. I mean, my my job is just to manage PETA's litigation docket, but we very much are involved in on the administrative side of things as well. We've done a number of petitions for rulemaking. Um, we also pretty routinely submit complaints about exhibitor facilities to the USDA and that kind of thing. Hi, um, so this is kind of related to the wildlife services um, action, but I was just wondering what sort of special challenges arise if you're planning to sue a federal agency as opposed to a private group? Yeah, I mean, so federal governments have all sorts of additional protections. Uh, typically, I mean, they have, in theory, sovereign immunity, right? So you can only sue uh, the federal government where they've waived sovereign immunity and where they've specifically granted causes of action to private parties. Uh, they also get a lot of benefits under the rules. You know, they get more time to answer uh, procedurally, things like that. And from a pragmatic perspective, um, judges, especially federal judges, are, are very respectful of government lawyers. So they do get, you know, uh, it can cut both ways. I mean, there are federal judges out there that don't like the government and don't trust the government lawyers. Uh, and have been harshly critical and sanctioned them and things like that. But in general, there's sort of a, a sense of professional courtesy. So when they want, you know, more time, they're going to get more time, uh, et cetera. So that it, it is a challenge dealing with the federal government. And before we end, I have a question for all of you. What do you see as some future trends that are coming down the road? I mean, what do you see as being some hot areas of litigation that you're anticipating, if any? <laughs> um, I, I think ESA cases for us are going to continue to be a pretty mm -hmm. major focus. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of them currently pending right now, and the ESA is, as Peter mentioned, such a protective statute, and we really think that it encompasses the types of conduct that we are routinely, routinely seeing at, um, at exhibitor type facilities. So certainly that. Yeah, I, I agree. The ESA is a great area. Um, someone in another question mentioned, you know, how do you deal with the zoo propaganda machine? Well, you could use that. You could turn that to your advantage and start bringing consumer fraud claims and mm -hmm. things like that. So that's sort of another area. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Kelsey Heberly, who's at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, focuses on that, where I think you could use a lot of tools of civil litigation to promote animal welfare, welfare rights issues, even when really you're using sort of consumer protection laws. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely the consumer protection stuff in the, my farm animal universe. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing, you have companies that will be misleading or lie about the conditions farm animals are kept in, but what often happens is there's a lie or a misrepresentation on the label, and because of that lie, the, the, the product is 20% more expensive. Um, and so it's very tempting to just stretch the truth. And not, you know, knocking back that tendency or, or um, you know, getting the FTC or you know, filing a civil lawsuit that gets these people to change the label may not seem like it's a you know, massive improvement for farm animals, but it really helps to keep people honest and um, if they want that profit bump uh, for being more humane, they actually need to improve their practices. Um, so I think that's a big, big piece of what's coming. Well, thank you. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you so much. And so now I'd just like to give a few comments as we conclude our 2017 Animal